Hey everyone, in today's video, I wanna share three ideas and activities to help you build confident mathematicians in your K through two classroom. There has been a lot of research done over the last decade about the relationship between math anxiety and math achievement. And there has been found that there is a correlation between the two. I recently just read two different articles um, from two different journals, the reading teacher as well as the mathematics teacher that go into a little more detail about this relationship. In fact, I will link both down in the description below. But what I took from both articles is that there are things we can do as classroom teachers, even at a young age, to help kind of get rid of that math anxiety. There's things that we can actually do that cause math anxiety and we want to avoid that. So in today's video, I have three different ideas and activities that you can use with your students to really just help build their confidence. So if you are ready to hear what these ideas are, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's dive in. Okay, tip number one is going to be a teacher shift, and that is to remember that we are all math people. Now, I talked a little bit about this in this video right here, five mistakes teachers make when teaching math. Um, and I kind of put this as like a precursor. It wasn't one of the five mistakes, but I did want to talk about it. So in today's video, it's going to be its own tip. And basically what I mean by this is for some reason when it comes to math, um, adults tend to talk about themselves as not math people or math people. When you think about this in relation to reading, you don't often hear adults say, oh, I'm not a reading person or I'm not very good at reading. Like that's something they don't generally say, but you hear people say, oh, I'm not a math person or, you know, I don't like to do math. I'm not good at math. You hear people say that all the time about math. There's kind of this notion that some people are math people and some people are not math people. And that is something as educators, we can kind of work to dispel. While the idea of math people came to be from a good place just by, you know, observing students and seeing that some students would quickly get math faster than others and that math may seem to be more difficult than others. So it came from this like good observation place at first, but unfortunately what it can do is if you're telling people that some people are math people, students will hear that, oh, well, some people aren't math people. And it gives them kind of a a quick like write off, like, oh, well, you know, math doesn't come easily to me, so math isn't for me, I'm not going to be good at math, and that's fine, when it's not fine. We can actually teach any student to be good at math. And of course, it's highly important for students to understand that if they are not good at something right away, they need to persevere. That is something we are always trying to teach our students. When we think of Carol Dweck and we think of the growth mindset, this is exactly what we're talking about. Just because our students aren't good at something right away doesn't mean they won't be good it. So how can we take this shift of thinking and apply it in the classroom? There's a few different ways we can do that, but most of it is going to be through our words. We know that our words are very powerful in the classroom, and as the teacher, not only do our words influence student identity, but they can also make shifts within different subjects. So by the way we address our students during math, we can shift their experience with math. So even if they are feeling like this is very difficult for them, we can help that through our words. Now, this video right here is one I made, I think, a year and a half ago, but it is phrases to use in the classroom to help build student agency. And those type of phrases are definitely going to help uh, in a math classroom and throughout your classroom in general. So I will link that video down below, but that is definitely one way that we can help our students feel confident within the math block. Another thing we can do as educators is really praise and focus on hard work and perseverance instead of always just the end product. So even though we definitely want our students to get the correct answer at the end, sometimes in math there's such a heavy focus on that end product that we kind of skip over the process. And if we aren't teaching our students how to persevere through different challenges and errors that they get, as they're working through that process, then it's more likely that they're just going to give up and not make it to the end product anyway. So to summarize tip one, we need to understand that we are all math people first and foremost. We need to, as educators, believe that, and we need to instill that mindset within our students. So focusing on a growth mindset, building student agency, and then really focusing on persevering are all going to help. 
All right, tip two when building confident mathematicians is to use a math talk every day to focus on the process. Now, I have talked about the importance of math talks in the classroom many different times. It is a great way to build conceptual learning, but it's also a great way to focus on the process over the product. I just mentioned in tip number one that sometimes in math we tend to focus so much on the correct answer at the end that we don't necessarily give the right amount of attention to the process it takes to get that right answer and a math talk is the perfect way to do that. Now, if you are new to math talks in the classroom, I highly suggest these two videos right here. This top one is going to give you a bunch of different math talk examples that I love to use in a K through two classroom. And then this one down here is also equally as important. This one is going to be different math talk phrases you should use during the math talk time in your classroom. And again, this one down here is really going to focus on getting students to productively talk about math, getting them to explain their thinking, uh, getting them to paraphrase phrase other students thinking. It's just a great one to check out. So if you are new to math talks, check out those two right there. I'll also link them down below for you to look at. Now during a math talk, essentially the teacher is going to put up a problem on the board for students to solve. Now it's not as simple as that, but it also kind of is. You simply put up the problem and then you ask students to explain how they got their answer. Again, you're not asking them what is their answer. You're asking them to explain how they got there, focusing on that process. As they share how they got their answer, as the teacher, you can go ahead and kind of show how they got it and write down what they're saying to you. So if they're saying they added these two numbers first, you can draw a little carrot to connect them and find the sum. And then you ask them more, what did you do next? Okay, when you got that, what did you do? Um, and then during this time, you're also asking students, is there another way you could solve this problem? Here's how so-and-so did it. Who can share another way? You're asking them things like, oh wait, who can tell me in their own words what that student just did. So one student did solve it and I wrote it down and then you're asking another student to kind of rephrase it or restate it in their own words. It helps them learn different ways that they may not have thought of to solve a problem. I should also point out that during this, you know, five minute process where I am asking students how they solved it, asking them to come up with other ways to solve it, revoicing how other students solved it and so on, I have not even confirmed yet whether the answer is correct or not. That is again, not the focus of the math talk. Instead, I'm really trying to kind of work out that process. And if a student did get it incorrect, then it would likely come out as we're talking through that process. Students would be like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Or wait, I don't think that's correct. And they can again, share how they would do it. Another thing that's important to mention is when I'm doing math talks within a classroom, it is very important to scaffold the problems. So they work kind of from easier ones to more difficult ones. Now this is important for a few different reasons. First and foremost, you know, it slowly builds to give students practice with some easier skills before moving to more difficult ones. But it's also important during a math talk because this is going to give all your students the opportunity to participate. If you just dive in with a really difficult problem, some of your students that aren't there yet might feel like they cannot participate in this conversation. They can't participate in the math talk. But if instead you start with more simple problems and really try to get some of those students who might be struggling a little bit with this skill to participate, talk through their process, and then you can build on it with the other students. To show you a quick example of what I mean, here is an example of a math talk that I would start. It says, what's the sum? And the skill that students are going to slowly work through is making 10, right? That is going to be the skill that I want my students to understand for this addition strategy. So here we have a simpler one. We have four dots up top and we have six on the bottom. And most of the students in my classroom should be able to solve this in some sort of way. Now I'm looking for my students to understand that the these top four can kind of, you know, visually be moved down to this bottom 10 frame and fill it in to make a 10. But also my students could simply just count all the dots to find the sum. And that is a completely acceptable answer at this point in time. So all of my students can participate in this math talk. Then we might move to one that looks like this. What's the sum here? Now here we have four different 10 frames. Maybe we can see eight plus two is going to equal 10 and then seven plus three at the bottom. We have two different ways that we're making 10. Still we're keeping it with that visual, but we are getting a little bit more difficult here. And here's a third example where it's a little bit more difficult. We have clearly moved from a visual and a representational showing of making 10 to the abstract, right? We only have the numbers here. So here we have five plus five, and then students might know, okay, that equals 10. Again, all of your students can probably participate in that. And then we have five plus one plus five. 
Again, what's the sum? Now again, I want my students to recognize, wait, five plus five equals 10. We just saw that in the problem above. So hopefully they add that five plus five first, but they don't have to. And then we have another one down at the bottom, four plus five plus five, just rearranging the numbers in that problem. So that was an example from my making tens math talks. Um, I have created a bunch of different math slides, over 300 different math talk slides, and they're broken up by skill. So you can get the bundle that looks like this right here um, with all of them. And that's going to really give you a wide range from more easier problems to more difficult ones within many different skills. But also if you click that link, which I'll put in the description, you can see that they are broken up and sold individually by different skills. Like you could buy just the making 10 skills and there'll be about 24 different slides for each. But again, you can create these yourself. You just wanna make sure that you scaffold them so all of your students can participate. To summarize, when using a math talk, you want to make sure that you're focusing on the process over the product, and you want to make sure that you are scaffolding them to really build participation with all of your students. You don't want your math talk to be a time where only your, your high flyers, for lack of a better word, are the ones participating and everyone else is just kind of looking at them and saying, oh yeah, those are the math people. That's not what we want. All right, and tip number three to building confident mathematicians is to read more math books during your math block. Now at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I recently read two different articles, one from the mathematics teacher and one from the reading teacher. And this tip comes from that reading teacher article. And it was so interesting because when we really think about it, in our reading time, with reading, with writing, we are constantly reading mentor texts, right? We know that students find joy listening to stories be read aloud. And so we do that often when we are in our reading time. We're connecting with characters. We are talking about the plot. We're talking about the setting. Um, in writing, we're talking about the author's craft and different things that they use that we want to go ahead and apply to our writing. But in math, we often kind of skip this step. Um, math is often presented in a much more stark way with very little connection to the real world and to ourselves. So what we can do as teachers is we can really try to add some more reading time during our math block. And now it doesn't need to be super specific. So if you're about to start a non-standard measurement unit, you don't necessarily need to find a book specific to non-standard measurement. If you do, that's great. That's a wonderful kickoff and you can talk about it. Um, but what we can do in general is just add more math books to our math block. So even if it is about a young mathematician or someone who is using math in the story to solve a problem, or maybe they win an award because of their math brain or whatever. There's so many different ways you can go about doing this, but again, the challenge is to just find great math books to also infuse into your teaching. Now I have a few math books I'm going to share with you that I love, but if you are looking for different math books that you think your students might enjoy, this website right here is a great one. It's called Mathematical Book Prize, and I believe the website is just mathematicalbooks.org. And this website every single year gives awards to books that focus on math. And you can actually kind of sort them by grade level. So they have, you know, grades K through two, math inspiring picture books. They have some for older students. It is just a great site that I recently find to find different math books for your students. I'll put that link down in the description for you to check out. But some that I absolutely love, here is Zero Zebras, a counting book about what's not there. So when you're focusing on adding zero, which is something we definitely teach in first grade, this book is a great kickoff to that. Um, you know, each page is going to be a little bit different, but essentially it's like, Five foxes curl up in their layers while zero zebras curl in their chairs. So it's rhyming, right? It's going to be a fun read aloud. It's going to reduce anxiety just because students are sitting and listening to it. But then we can also build off of it. We have five foxes over here and zero zebras. So five plus zero is still going to be five. This one right here is another book I love. It's called A Counting Book About Building Billions of Bricks. Um, and this is a counting book where it kind of focuses on skip counting. There are some pages where they're counting bricks by two, four, six, counting by fives, tens, even by twenties. Um, and they kind of go from building something small with just a couple bricks to building something bigger and bigger and bigger and they end up using a billion bricks by the end. So, so just another fun one for you to do with counting. This book right here is a cute one, Lemonade in Winter, a book about two kids counting money. 
Um, this is a fun one, especially in the K through two realm, your students might be familiar with starting a lemonade stand. Uh, these two children here like to do that, but during the winter time, so you kind of see how that works for them. But also throughout the book, as they are collecting money or trying to collect money, um, they're counting quarters and they are counting different coins to add up how much money they're earning during their lemonade stand. So a great one to kick off money. This one's probably great for kindergarten and first grade when you are diving into shapes and using shapes to configure different shapes. Um, it's called Shapes Reshape. And in this book, you will see a bunch of different, each page will kind of be like, you'll see a bunch of different objects here and you can even talk about what type of shape these are. These are a bunch of red rectangles. It says, these shapes reshape into pinchy things. What could they be? And then you see five crabs nip your nose nipping. So they took all of the rectangles and they turned them into little crabs. Again, just a fun one for introducing bunches of different shapes. Here's a more general math one. This is called The Girl with a Mind for Math, the story of Ray Montague. And this was a young girl who was very good at math from a young age. Not only was she good at it, but she loved it and she enjoyed it. And it just talks about her story and what it was like being a young female mathematician. And on top of that, she was a young female black mathematician. So throughout her journey, um, it actually similarly reminds me of May Among the Stars, where uh, like her teacher was like, oh, you wanna be an astronaut? How about you be a nurse instead? I believe it was a nurse, she said, because that's just what you know, they thought women should do at the time. So throughout her journey, she often gets mistaken for a secretary at her job, even though she's one of the brightest math minds, you know, that there are. So this is just a story in general about somebody who loves math and is great at math and perseveres quite a bit to become a great mathematician. And lastly, another book I love is this one right here. It's called Small World. Um, and this book is more abstract. The other one is about a girl who loved math and her entire journey into becoming a mathematician. Um, but on this one, it's more about noticing math all around you from a young age. And so it's not going to be explicitly stated on each page, but she kind of starts off in her small little world. Um, you know, we have bubbles all around us, how are bubbles formed and created? We have math and science everywhere. Uh, slides, swings, whirly gigs, tumbles through the grass. Um, just kind of noticing as this little girl, she starts off when she's being born and as she gets older, all the different math concepts that are all around her. Um, scaffolding steel, building buildings. You can talk to students about how math is very necessary for things, you know, like building. Soaring through glass and stone. Here we have architecture and different glass mosaics everywhere. We have people reading books and people driving. But this book can really be a great kickoff for how, again, math is everywhere and math is necessary for many different jobs. It says Nanda got bigger and bigger, but as she grew, the world grew too. So here she is flying a plane over the ocean. We have a rocket ship launch. Just so many different things that math is presented in in the real world when you actually take a look around. Those are a bunch of my recent favorite finds and I will link them down below in case any one of those kind of stood out to you. I have shared these in the past before, but any of these math start books, um, these ones are going to be specific to different skills, numbers to 100. Um, counting by twos, threes, and fours, measuring, but the math start books are great for kicking off a particular skill uh, through a story and then like talking about the story. But again, to summarize tip three, let's infuse more read alouds into our math block. Not only do read alouds in general lower student anxiety and get them excited about learning, but they also can make connections to the story and gain a bigger understanding and purpose for what we're about to learn. All right, just to recap these three big tips for building confident mathematicians. Number one is a teacher mindset shift, and it's to remember that all students are math students. Number two is to focus on the procedure over the end product, and we can do that during math talks. And number three is to infuse more read alouds during our math time. Now, as always, everything I mentioned in this video will be linked down in the description. If you are on mobile, be sure to click that little down arrow to expand more so you can see all the links that are down there. 
Um, and now I would love to know from you, which of these three tips do you feel like you most need to work on in your classroom? For me, I definitely know it is number three. I know that I should infuse more stories into math block, but I honestly just, it kind of just goes right over my head. I sometimes I'll grab one here and there and I love the way it really kicks off a lesson with my students, but then I don't know, I just forget about it. So that's something I definitely want to work on going into next year. Let me know yours down in the comments. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one. Bye.